welcome back. So um, this is the final talk in uh, today's session, and then um, you will uh, go for the uh, break. And um, so uh, let me welcome Ruben Ordus for this session and give him a big hand. Oh. Hey. Hello. Hello. Yep, now it works. All right. <coughs> hey guys, uh, first, thanks of course uh, for having me here. Thanks for uh, attending this talk. Um, all right, so my name, as it says there, my name is Ruben Reduce. I'm a technical advocate for IBM Blue Box. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the user, a better user experience in the command line. Um, so usually when you hear about uh, user experience, it's usually about a web UI, a flashy new functionality that you want to do. You want to have a, a good user experience. Um, here I'm going to try to, uh, or I will make the case that a user experience also belongs in the command line. Um, and uh, as we, we talked, uh, as I go through the talk, you'll realize uh, why this is the case and why it matters. So, you know, like in your next project, if you're going to build a, a, some sort of compiler or a, a build tool or even a utility that you and your friends use, uh, use uh, you know, bear in mind these concepts, bear in mind uh, these things I will speak about, and then, you know, hopefully it, it will be a, a more successful endeavor. <coughs> so, why, wh why this matters? So, CLI tools and command line tools, they're for humans, all right? That, that is the premise of it all. Um, so, humans, at least to the best of my knowledge, we cannot read minds. I cannot, I don't know what you're thinking. Well, I know what you're thinking, but I don't know what you're thinking. Um, and then, uh, and by that I mean, I don't know what uh, the author of a given CLI meant, and, and I don't know uh, the way that he thought about the problem at hand to actually know how to use a tool. And then much less in the past, like so maybe that tool was written, uh, you know, like a year ago. And, uh, you know, I cannot know what, possibly know what the person was without somehow like documentation or some other means of knowing what the tool philosophy is and why it was built. <coughs> uh, many cases, uh, we don't have access to online resources. So if you have a new command line that you need to deal with, and all of a sudden you're offline, you, there, you have no Stack Overflow, you have no Google, what do you do? Uh, I mean, you just have, how many times have I have encountered myself where I have to refer to one of these two resources, um, or even go to their GitHub repo and try to find the, the, the documentation or code, and you know, simply there's times where there's just no access, and good luck with that. Um, humans are very fast learners. We are very good, you know, lots of research has been done on this, that we're very good at pattern recognition. We're very fast at learning, and one of the easiest ways to have people learn is to actually be able to uh, get the expected results with a, you know, with a certain amount of inputs, and you get some results, or through experimentation, um, and we recognize the patterns very, very quickly, much better than any computer ever that will ever be devised, I, I would venture to say. Um, so, you know, this is something that we need to use when we are designing uh, our tools, our command line tools. <coughs> we also get frustrated rather quickly. Um, and I'm using here one of the biggest culprits on really bad UX, uh, which is OpenSSL, the command line. Um, uh, those who have used it, you know, uh, I, I don't need to, sp uh, you probably know this by heart now, but those who haven't, it's a very, very frustrating experience. Um, I'm One sample command here is just that you just change this position of the verify from the beginning to the end, and that command breaks, the same command. Um, so, you know, like, uh, it, that's when people begin flipping tables, and that's when people begin uh, getting mad at your tool. And uh, in the case of open, open SSL, they happen to be fortunate that nobody else at the moment has a dominant tool in the command line, else people would migrate immediately. <coughs> uh, this is very important. This is actually, we came uh, this more earlier this morning, I was speaking with some folks about this very thing, is that uh, you know, humans, when confronted with a problem at the first, uh, first time, we understand words. We understand this is the way that we communicate. Uh, 
single flags, single letter flags, that might have made sense, say, 20 years ago when you know, memory was a very, very scarce resource and you needed to load all that stuff into memory, so a flag made a difference because it was one character versus a whole string. Uh, today, we fortunately don't have those limitations. Uh, so, you know, we shouldn't keep, you know, uh, perpetu uh, perpetuating uh, these uh, uh, patterns of trying to condense meaning in a uh, one letter word. I mean, like, words can be expressive and these will make your tool easier to use. Um, you don't have to be, you know, incredibly complex. You can even do something simple as to, like, if you have never used the, uh, the word count, uh, command, what does that L mean? If you never use it, you, you don't really know. Uh, you need to Google it or find it somewhere else. Uh, if that command were written something like uh, WC lines, then you would know what it does. It's counting the lines. <coughs> Another pattern, a pattern that you should definitely think about when you're building your uh, tools is that focus on task. Fo focus on, you know, like, actions, verbs, like what is this command supposed to be doing? Is it, is it a build system? Right, you make sure that it builds. Or is it a deploy system? Deploy, uh, it, it, you know, if it's a, a, an utility trying to fetch something from somewhere, use the verb fetch, the word, or whatever, you know, word you find more fit to your, uh, to your particular command line. Um, so I give you two good examples here uh, of like you know good you know OpenStack server list. You know what that's going to do. And, you know that better bring a list of servers. And CF push. Well, that better push the thing to the servers. Um, in the case again, oh, I'm not trying to pick an OpenSSL, but it, it happens to be a really bad example. Is a uh, uh, for instance PKCS12 in and out. All right. That's a bad, in my opinion, a really bad. Why? Because there's no action. So, like, unless you know beforehand or Google or uh, Stack Overflow, you don't know what that's going to do. You just know that there's a file in and as an argument and a file out. But you have no idea what action that's going to do to it. <coughs> Another pattern. Leverage, hi like, hierarchies or pseudo-hierarchies, if you want to call it, or navigation trees. Um, instead of having, a, you know, a pattern that is very common th that I've seen throughout my years, is that you try to like, you know, chain commands, big length commands, and then uh, that ends up being very confusing or unnecessarily uh, confusing for the user. Um, try to use it like, you know, parse them into into uh, words. In this case, you have the, in the case of the OpenStack CLI. Um, you have OpenStack is the root. I mean, that is the, 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 the root command. And then you have the sub commands, the, which is network and server. In this case, those are entities. Uh, so that will be your, your, your first branch of there. And then you have actions on this. You have show, and then you have list, or you can have any number of actions on this. This makes it really easy to learn and really easy to use. And, um, uh, and that, again, for any tool that you are building or thinking of building, this is just patterns that can be fairly easy implemented. And um, it, will it, it will help your tool big, uh, a lot if you actually uh, manage to come up with a hierarchy of things in case the hierarchy is needed. It might not be needed. <coughs> um, I give one here that is not so good. And I want to emphasize not so good. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. Uh, it's just that it, it's not as great as it could be. Uh, the Mistral action get definition, for instance. Um, in my opinion, that could be written as Mistral action show. I mean, just you have the action, which is the, the, the entity that you're acting upon, and then you have the get definition, or you, you can say show, which is a common pattern or any similar pattern. You can have fetch, show, whatever the case may be. Um, and then, you, you again, you make it very easy to understand, very easy to memorize. You are more likely to memorize the one at the bottom than the one at the top. Feedback for humans. All right. So you go, you're in your command. People are running your command. So what did they do? Uh, you know. So like you run the command, and what happens? Well, uh, I've had many times where I've run a command line, and it's you know it takes the prompt away, and then it returns, and I have no idea what happened. Um, that is terrible. I mean, like uh, you need to tell the let the user know what's going on with your program. Um, and then the way that I see is a very voice, but more important, meaningful. Like, I, I will explain in, in, a, in why this is important in a later slide. Uh, it's got to be meaningful. And then, of course, if the user just willfully wants to ignore all output, that's fine. You can give the option for that. But default, 
uh, for very verbose. Um, try to use a like X of Y task complete or X task complete, and uh, try to avoid like percent completes for the overall uh, task. If it's a task that has subtask, um, because you can get into the trouble of saying yes. Let's say you ha you have a command that runs a hundred tasks, and then you have ninety nine tasks done, and you display ninety nine percent, and then the last task happened to take an hour, for instance, just as an example. Um, and then the person and the user will be say, oh, look, 99% is almost done. And then half an hour later, the command's still in 99%. Uh, so like, try to avoid when you're having a command that with subtask, try to give overall percentages. That's going to confuse the user. It's going to frustrate the user. Um, so try to go for just like, well, there's 99 tasks out of 100. It doesn't mean that it's a percentage. It doesn't mean a time estimate at all. It simply means that there's just one more task to go. Now, for the subtasks themselves, if they happen to be deterministic, and by that I mean in this case, uh, in the case of, of in particular example uh, of PIP, like they know exactly how many kilobytes, how many bytes are there in that fetch. So they can totally tell, you know, like, like and they don't give you a time estimate or anything to that end, but they tell you what percentage complete is because, again, you, every byte is going to be one byte, right? So like they know that one byte will be one byte no matter what, and they can give you a good estimate, a uh, deterministic percentage to that. Okay, so I, I go back to the, the few, a couple of slides ago where it says like verbose or meaningful. Um, the problem is, is that uh, you can, you know, accidentally or unintentionally be very extremely verbose, and then you end up having with a standard or standard output all dumped into the screen. Uh, that's equally unhelpful as pretty much not having any feedback, or worse, because you might miss very important feedback amongst all the other stuff. Uh, if has anybody worked in, uh, as anybody who has worked in a, a, like infrastructure automation or anybody who has worked um, with like a large comp a build systems, et cetera, like if you, you know, where there's hundreds of different actions going on and uh, all of a sudden you get a dump of standard error, standard output, you're gonna miss very important feedback and I in my own experience, I've had uh, that uh, excessive output, you know, like throw me on loops for hours. I mean, just not finding out why this thing not working, it turns out that it was a command that was incomplete that I couldn't find because it was so incredibly, incredibly noisy. It was really hard to find. Uh, terminal colors, this is a new trend that I've seen that uh, many command line tools use. And yes, it looks nice. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna deny you that. But uh, I think it also, um, I've seen the cases where sometimes the escape sequences are not complete or the maybe the, the, the library they use didn't use the correct escape sequences for a color. So I end up with a bunch of garbage in my screen. And then I miss the, the actual output because you know, the, the authors were trying to be you know, nice and try to give me a nice uh, color coded <coughs> and uh, end up being worse. Uh, there's another thing too, because then it starts with analogies. Well, green means good, red means bad, yellow means meh, maybe a warning, and blue means just a, you know, debug information or whatever. Uh, but not everybody follows these standards, and then some people will, uh, you know, like uh, some tools would write red in your, in your, because that's the way that your terminal interprets that escape sequence. Uh, it red for things that are informational, and then yellow for things that should be just normal, you know, like a debug output. And then um, uh, it, it you can actually confuse the user more than it gets. So I say, like, if you, you want to use it, um, let's say you can start with a one at the beginning where it says, like, start, and one at the end. If it was successful, you can put yay, and then, you know, if you fail, you can put boo, whatever, in red. <coughs> um, Another important thing is uh, provide the option for a log file, a, a, like a specifying a log file location. Uh, this is very important too. If you want to uh, use automated tools or if you, this tool that you're going to write is going to be part of a build system, a larger build system, uh, you want to be able to go back to the log file and see execution. Uh, if something went wrong, you make sure that it's there, et cetera. Uh, it's, so this is a, a fairly important thing. Uh, uh, if your tool, again, it's going to be, uh, it's a large task, for smaller tasks, like let's say if you're doing something for your own amusement or whatever, you and your friends, uh, you know, maybe you don't have to do this, but if it's going to be part of a, a larger product, or a, you know, a build system, a push system, a deploy system, whatever, that requires many, many, many other tasks, 
log files are always a good idea. So um, th this is the other part, right? the, the, the part from what you expect from the user. Um, yeah, you need to try to use only what is really needed to run that command. Uh, you know, like the first time that you run a command, even let's say with, uh, just to give an example, just because I've been using it lately a lot, uh, the OpenStack command, it will complain that there's no credentials. Right, well, you need to provide credentials in that command. Um, and then, or, you know, but that's only the first time. After the first time, those credentials can be in the, an environment variable. It can be in your, uh, in the home folder, in a file, whatever. So once you set that initial setup, there's no need to require those again. Um, and, uh, you know, there are tools that I've used, and then they require overly specific things that don't have any bearing on to the actual command that I'm running. Um, and, you know, these are things that really frustrate uh, people, uh, I found. Uh, it's just, well, why are you requiring me to input this again? And then, you know, or, you know I don't need to uh, specify a log format. There should be a, a default format for the output. Uh, so, you know, these are very, very important things. I, uh, for instance, just as, as an example, you just add the command list. Then you can f uh, add a filter if you want to it. Um, it is not a mandatory thing. So um, it, it also you can add dash dash format uh, JSON, and then you you know if your tool pro, uh, supports it, then you provide the JSON output as requested by the user. <coughs> this is um, the a very um, important point that I would like to make is th make the help helpful. Like make sh make sure that if your user, uh, you know, again, they don't have online support, they don't have access to internet connections, make sure that they can find out what they need ju from just from your tool. <coughs> um, so a lot of people rely, oh, well, people can just Google it, or people can just look at my, uh, at my um, GitHub d uh, repo or whatever, uh, whatever the documentation happens to be, or write the docs, whatever. Um, th the case is that, again, you're offline, so you, have, you, you only have the tool itself to tell you how to do it. So, you know, uh, if you're going to do this, you can try to do the help in a very scope way. Uh, don't try to, you know, uh, man pages to me are uh, a bad pattern. Like, yes, it's better than nothing, absolutely. But it, you can have man pages that is like 20, you know, scrolls long. And um, sometimes the examples they provide are not very helpful or not relevant to what you're looking for. Um, so it's a matter of providing, for instance, like just in this first example, uh, the help should only be about that first subcommand. And uh, in, this sec in, this third, in this second instance, then the help should be about the action, not about the command. Whatever help is available for the action. A and in this case, the command help, it should only go one level deep. It should not, go, it should not cover the action. It should only cover the, the list of subcommands that it does, that it, it supports. <coughs> Silent is deadly. Like errors should always, always be displayed to the screen, even if the user says quiet mode. Uh, errors, it, you know, it, I, I've run many times, uh, I would say more than I uh, care to admit, when I run an application and it seems that it runs successfully and then I go and try to test what it did and nope, it's not there. Um, it's very frustrating. So, and I actually, this was a couple of years ago, there was a tool that had this issue, and then I looked at the code, and there was something like that. Um, uh, this is like, you know, it was trying to get a, a, a service endpoint, and then there was the exception, and it was a pass. So, the, when it fails in that, you will never know where that error came from. Um, then, and, and of course, the whole thing wouldn't work, but since the, uh, the exception was mishandled like this, but accidentally, by the way, because it was like a to-do that they never go back to doing. Um, so, like, you know, submit the PR, et cetera, and that was fixed. But this is just illustrates an example of, you know, like, if you are uh, collecting errors, whether it's for the logger or for the screen, uh, just make sure that you handle all your exceptions and that you are as specific as you can with exceptions and with the errors that, you go that you're collecting. <coughs> um, error should be specific. Uh, there is, you know, like this happens in the web too, and this happens in, in many other medium uh, uh, media that you can think of. It's like, oh, whoops, something went wrong. And you, as, a, as, as, the, as the end user, uses, okay, what went wrong? And then you start 
having to look at debug output or log files, et cetera. And it, you know, you, you always end up empty handed having to Google what does this mean, you know, and it just it is a very frustrating. So like I always, you know, advocate for people to be very, very specific with their errors. <coughs> Stack trace. Okay, so the most of what people do I up to now is that when a command fails, just give the stack trace. This is not bad, actually. This is good, it, but it's only half the story. Sometimes the stack trace that gets outputted to the screen um, can actually be just like a ra whatever la last got executed. It might not be directly related to the error. So it's just like sometimes, oh, such and such argument missing, and then the user is, no, I'm pretty sure I provided that argument, so why is this failing? Um, so like you, you need to provide a context, and you need to provide you know, like a specific that happened with that stack trace. So uh, it, it some uh, many tools do it correctly. It just uh, it, you know, like for instance, this one. Like so, you have a stack trace above that, and then it gives you an error number and it tells you can assign request to address. Well, you know how to fix that, or you know how to look it up. Uh, if that was just imagine that the this last line, the soccer error, was not there, and all you get is the one on top, you wouldn't know what to do about it. Like, or do we spend a in, you know a reasonable amount of time finding it? Um, in this case, you're not authorized to request the action. That is a very clear error. I know why I'm not able to run that command. It, um, so you just always be specific and always provide a human readable uh, reason why it failed. <coughs> All right, so what uh, this talk, I guess the motivation of it is, is basically, it, you know, don't think of command lines of you know, like executables for power user. Oh, that's going to be a size, a, a system administrator, a system operator. You know, think of like any human can actually be, a, a, should be able to use your command. Um, and also, the main is like, oh, this is just for another program to consume. And then, true, that might be another program that will consume it, but who will write the code for that? It's another human. So another human will have to write the templates for your command. So you always have to assume that the end user of your um, command line application or CLI or whatever, it's going to be a human. That's the ultimate. So think in terms of all that we've talked about and then making sure that you make things for humans. So focus on the human aspect. Um, like uh, in uh, my experience in the last, I would say, half a decade, working with different organizations uh, that have, uh, you know, run studies, A-B testing um, that we've run with different usability uh, uh, labs, et cetera. It just uh, it becomes very, very evident, very fast that, you know, the any investment that you do, uh, and the user experience will pay itself many times over. Um, again, there's, you know, uh, you, you can look many use cases, uh, that if you go into any uh, conference for like even JavaScript or uh, CSS or whatever, um, sometimes like small changes, like they change uh, the page load by let's say a quarter of a second, and that means a 28% increase in bounce rates or whatever, it's a decrease in bounce rates. So it, it's every penny that you can spend on usability, UX, whether it's performance or whether it's actually usability is Definitely, definitely worth it sh uh, th the time. Um, this is the other uh, one of my theses is you can have the most brilliant and clever tool you'll ever seen. It can do amazing things, but if it's very, very hard to use, it's an unusable tool, and it will be, you know, it will be basically uh, used by a few people who actually take the time to study it or take the time to figure it out. Um, and you know, if you're going to spend the time writing a command line tool or a build system or whatever. You know, making sure that you you be users, and the last issue be obvious is a corollary: happy users, more users. At least uh, again, there's plenty of uh, empirical and data evidence that has been, at least in the last three jobs that I've had that have done this very analytically. They just you know, the more the more your users are happy, not just about the service but about the experience. That's the important part. Uh, th that then you get more users. It's like a, it is a, a virtual cycle, if you will. Like people bring, I mean, happy people will recommend other people, and those people are happy people. And it, word of mouth is very, very important. So hopefully, if you follow some or all of this advice I've given you, there will be a lot less of this. 
and a lot more of that. Now, this is one last slide before you all go, there's a break, I know, and then uh, before you all go, this is a very important last slide, this. So, uh, you know, so you say, well, that's very great. How do we get started? I highly, highly recommend the Click Library. Uh, it, it's a very, very easy to use. It's uh, very, very comprehensive. You have a lot of things already set up for you. Um, if you're inclined to use Node.js because NPM makes it easier to distribute, uh, which I would agree with you, uh, then I would say use the commander.js, which again has a very comprehensive set of functionality that you can use. And lastly, but, but uh, finally, but not le <laughs> last but not least, uh, the design of everyday things. I mean, this is a book, in my opinion, it was like life changing for me when I read it. It just, uh, it should be mandatory reading for all computer science people. It just, uh, you know, we have this, uh, you know, stigma about, oh, you know, it's that's for designers. You shouldn't read it. No, like it, it, the concepts that he talks about, about the human interaction and about human perception, and how you should design. It will change the way that you think about designing your APIs, the way that you develop uh, uh, programs. It, again, I cannot recommend it enough. It's called The Design of Everyday Things by uh, Don Norman. And if it, there's one thing that you get out of this talk is just to go at least check out this book. Uh, it is a very, 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 very interesting. I'm, I'm very sure that you will find it to be very interesting as well. And finally, thank you very much for listening to me talk. And uh, this is the way that you get a hold of me. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Yeah. Now, uh, the next break is the longer break with 30 minutes. And uh, after that, uh, we will be uh, at 16.10, performance testing for modern apps, Dustin White. So um, I'm looking forward to that session myself. I'm a QA guy, yeah. So, this long break, uh, you can uh, grab the beer, as uh, he said. So uh, enjoy. Yeah. See you soon.